Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honour for me to be here to be able to celebrate the 25 years of the College of Anaesthetists and also to have the opportunity to talk to you about pain in children. Now, as we've heard, the, the question about whether children feel pain or not was certainly an issue when I started training as well. Um, but really we've moved far beyond that now and I'd really like to focus on the fact about how and when children feel pain. I could just say they feel pain, yes they do, and sit down, um, but I want to go into a little more detail. Now if we think about the definition of pain as set forward by the International Association for the Study of Pain, it importantly acknowledges both the sensory and emotional components of the experience. And in this brief um, version of the, of the definition, it appears to focus predominantly on self-report and verbal description. But it's very clear within the taxonomy that people who are uh, pre-verbal um, or infants or are unconscious in intensive care or cognitively impaired, whether they be children or adults, still do need to have pain assessed and appropriately managed. And in fact, if we think about small babies and infants, they can actually report their pain in different ways and we just need to be um, aware of how to assess that. So in intensive care or in anaesthesia, we may be predominantly focusing on physiological responses like changes in heart rate and blood pressure. On the ward, we'll be looking at behavioural changes and cry and specific facial features that have been associated with pain. But in a research setting as well, there's very clear evidence now that there are specific and acute responses um, to noxious stimuli, even in the most preterm infant. And these can be assessed by changes in stress hormones and cortisol, by measuring um, reflex withdrawal, and importantly also um, showing activation right through to the level of the brain and the somatosensory cortex um, with either near infrared or EEG. So very clear, as I said, that nociceptive pain signalling pathways are functional after birth. If we think about um, managing pain, clearly we need to be able to measure it and measure the intensity. And there's a range of different tools that can be used, um, but they need to be sensitive enough to titrate <coughs> the analgesia against response um, and uh, enter into a cycle of assessment and treatment and assessing, assessing response. Now there are a range, as I say, of different tools um, and, and I'm just going to quickly go through some. In intensive care we use the comfort tool which looks at behavioural and physiological parameters. In pre-verbal infants we use the FLAC tool which is an observational behavioural tool. In older children over about four or five years of age they can actually use um, a FACES scale to report intensity of pain. And beyond about eight to ten years children can actually use a numerical rating scale as we do in adults. But I think importantly, pain assessment is much more than just measuring severity. And I think this is where um, you know, my work on a, on a pain round really um, becomes much more um, involved. So for example, um, thinking about some of the children that I've seen recently, if there's a child there with cystic fibrosis and a chest strain sitting rigidly in bed saying, no, actually I'm fine, my pain's only one, but they can't actually cough or do their physio, that's clearly not adequate pain relief. Similarly, if a child's come out of intensive care and they're quite irritable, have they actually still got pain or are they actually suffering from withdrawal symptoms and need a weaning plan? And so there's a whole range of different contexts that we need to consider within overall pain assessment. In addition, we need to deal with quite marked variability. So in paediatric practice, we may be dealing with a 600 gram preterm neonate um, at the beginning of the list and 130 kilo adolescent at the end. And across that age range, there's gonna be huge changes in the safety and efficacy and dose and type of analgesia that we use and also the appropriate level of monitoring. But also even within a, a given age range, there can be marked individual variability in pain response. And we all have had patients or ourselves, you know, think about whether we have a high pain threshold or a low pain threshold, and is there any evidence for that? So these are actually measures from 150 19 to 20 year olds, so an age range that you're much more probably uh, familiar with, many of you. And this is using a very controlled experimental technique. There's a thermode on the hand, it changes temperature at a fixed rate, and the subject presses the button when it starts to feel painful. 
Now, the median is about 43 degrees and the 95% confidence intervals are quite tight because it's such a big sample. But you can see there's huge variability between what one person feels is painful and what the next person feels. And as anaesthetists, we're used to having very tight control over physiological parameters. So this sort of thing can make us feel a little bit uncomfortable and certainly makes the statistics a lot more difficult. Um, but we need to be able to, to deal with this level of, of variability in our day-to-day -day practice. Interestingly, I also did uh, measurements on this same group when they were 11 and 12 years old. Um, and at that age, their, their thresholds were much lower. They were more sensitive when they were younger. We've still got the variability. And as they got older, not only did the thresholds go up, but the differences between males and females um, became much more relevant. Now, there's a lot of interest in looking for genetic markers of, of pain <coughs> sensitivity. Um, and also looking at epigenetic mechanisms which underlie the interactions between genes and environment and may alter our response um, to, to pain. But what I haven't told you about this data is that about two thirds of this group were actually born extremely preterm in 1995. And so I was assessing them and comparing them to a term born group of controls. And that early life experience had had a significant impact on their sensory processing, even into early adulthood when they were 19 or 20. And in particular, those that had had surgery as neonates had a much greater degree of change. So that early experience is having a much longer term effect. If we think about the emotional side of pain, I also looked at anxiety and catastrophizing or the degree to which people worry about pain. That was actually more related to their current pain experience than their sensory thresholds. But if we think about this sort of underlying variability and then someone comes along and has a different type of surgery, their response to analgesics can be very different in the way that they handle or respond to the analgesia, their susceptibility to side effects, um, whether they can metabolise the drug or not. Um, and then on top of that, both the child and the parents have different expectations and beliefs. It's very clear that we can't just have a one size fits all. Um, and while we might like to sort of think of parameters in, in little boxes, we can't take this approach with pain. And we really need to have a, a pain service with regular review and the ability not only to start with a, a pain management plan, but then to modify it as needed um, according to individual needs. The other sort of thing that we normally expect after surgery is that there'll be a period of um, time of pain and, and uh, requirement for analgesia, but then recovery will, will occur and everything will go back to normal. But there's an increasing awareness that a proportion of people will develop persistent pain after surgery. And in fact, one of the top 10 research priorities in the uh, perioperative research priority setting exercise last year was what can we do to stop people developing chronic pain after surgery. So it's very clear that we need to be able to both identify people at risk and also understand the underlying mechanism so that we can improve outcome. Now there's a lot of evidence now that early life adversity and stress can actually have a much longer term impact on health outcome than perhaps we initially um, thought. And that this can have an effect not only on, on the incidence and prevalence of chronic pain in adult life, but also on health outcomes such as anxiety that may influence pain response. And based on my um, work with the preterm cohort, I've been looking and interested in the fact whether having surgery in the neonatal period also is a factor related to early life experience that increases the risk of persistent pain if surgery is required in later life. And certainly the changes we've seen in, in the preterm cohort would suggest that that's a possibility. <coughs> However, um, to, to really look at that more um, closely and understand the mechanisms, we need to go back to our science lab and look at a model there. Now, if we do surgery in adulthood, we can see a clear increase in reflex sensitivity um, after, after surgery, but it does improve and resolve. However, if the same group have had surgery as neonates as well, there's not only a much greater response, so an increased hypersensitivity or increased pain, but it also lasts for longer. And so both the degree and the duration have, have an impact. 
Importantly then, if we do a local anaesthetic at the time of this initial surgery, we can actually prevent this long-term change. And so now they behave exactly the same as if they didn't have that prior experience. Now this is important from two perspectives. One is that clearly local anaesthetic block is a clinically applicable intervention that we can use and take forward into clinical trials. But it also emphasises that there's something different in the developing nervous system. So it's the activity that's coming in that's having a long-term impact um, in this early stage of life. And we don't see that with the same injury performed at older ages. Again, in the lab, we can look more specifically at the mechanisms underlying this. And we've been interested in the role of microglia in the spinal cord. Now, as their name implies, these cells were initially thought just to be small sort of glue that held the nervous system together. But it's now clear that there's very close communication between nerves and microglia that control pain sensitivity. And again, after, after an injury in, in adulthood, we see an increase in microglial activity um, that resolves as the pain improves. However, if we go back to our model with the early injury as well, we see a much greater level of activation and that matches both the degree and the duration that we see in terms of the um, pain sensitivity. So we can now test whether that's actually important and we can inhibit microglial activity. And if we do that, we do see a reduction back to the sort of normal baseline. The other thing that we can do is actually try and prevent it from very early on in life, like we did with the local anaesthetic. And in fact, we did see that that also brought the response back to normal, but only in males. And this work has been um, shown in, in adult models as well, that there's a different signalling mechanism in males and females. Um, and so if we are looking at very specific analgesics or, or interventions, we need to consider whether those mechanisms are actually different in males and females. That will have a big impact on clinical trials going forward. So what about now about neuropathic pain? And so a lot of the pain that's um, occurring after surgery um, and, and persisting is due to injury to nerves and something that we call neuropathic pain. And the most obvious example is um, after amputation, where children will often describe a squeezing, tight, burning sensations, stabbing. And that's fine if you're old enough to be able to do that. In younger children, again, we're still reliant on watching their behavior. And in fact, one of the first boys that I saw um, when I was, uh, when I was a, a sort of junior consultant doing a round um, had had an amputation, was curled up on the bed, very withdrawn and just scratching the bed beneath the stump. Now, to me, that's a sign of, of, of phantom limb pain. I don't need him to tell me all the rest. I'm prepared to treat empirically on that basis. Um, children can also help us out with diagrams. This is a boy who's actually got Fabry's disease and he's got burning pain that he rates at 8 out of 10 in his feet, less severe in his hands and he's also got abdominal pain. But importantly we need to think about the impact of pain um, on sort of more global aspects both for the child and also for the family in terms of quality of life, um, cost in terms of time and time off work um, and also for the, as I say, for the family. And so I just want to share you, with you um, parts of an email that I got from, from a father who uh, wanted to remind me about, about his son who'd had um, surgery um, to actually remove a tumour that had caused nerve damage in his leg. When we first saw him, he couldn't put his foot to the floor, he was in a wheelchair, he couldn't weight bear, and eventually over, over some weeks, um, he improved and he's since done very well. And his father sent me a photo of him uh, bushwalking in, in the Blue Mountains. Now what's important about this was that it was actually 15 years later that the father sent me this email. And so he actually remembered that and was you know, still wanting to let me know that his, his son was doing well, um, which is incredibly important. I think, interestingly, he thought I would have forgotten this boy. I could, <laughs> if the building hadn't been pulled down, I could take you to the bed in the children's hospital in Melbourne where this boy was. And I think that's one of the advantages of, of being a clinical academic is that it's these sort of patient experiences that really mould our research. And, and it's this neuropathic pain and difficult to control pain that's had a big impact on my clinical practice and, and research since then. 
There's a range of different causes um, of, of neuropathic pain in children, some that are similar, some that are different um, to adults. Um, but also there are specific conditions that will present initially in childhood. And recognition of these rare genetic diseases can actually give us an insight again into mechanism and new analgesic targets. And so um, alterations in the NAV 1.7, this is a very specific subtype of sodium channel. Again, when I was a medical student, I only thought there was one type of sodium channel. There's actually a whole lot of different subtypes. And if this one, if there's a loss of function mutation, it actually causes insensitivity to pain. And you might think that that's a good thing, um, but actually, you know, a child that I've seen with that presented with febrile convulsions because she didn't know that she had a dental abscess. Um, so the actual protective or aspects of pain are very important. But if there's a, a gain of function mutation, this actually increases sensitivity, the, so the channels become very active, um, and that causes very severe pain. Now, recognition of this has meant that there's a lot of drug company interest in developing a very specific drug that not only would be helpful for these children and for adults with the condition, but hopefully will have broader applicability for neuropathic pain. In terms of management, um, you know, the first step is really recognition and, and education. And again, you know, there have been huge changes in the recognition of neuropathic pain um, in, in children over the last, you know, 20 years since, since I've been um, in the field. And a number of educational um, initiatives that we do with the trainees who are uh, doing their advanced pain training, they come and spend time with us with e-learning packages, also with the College of Paediatricians um, to try and improve awareness um, about neuropathic main pain um, and its diagnosis. And we're looking at, at validating more measures um, for diagnosis because it still is a, a, an area of need. We use a biopsychosocial model and use interdisciplinary treatment um, and hopefully in the future we'll have more mechanism-based pharmacotherapy. At the moment we're really extrapolating treatments from adult practice and we need more specific evidence for, for children. <coughs> So I just want to finish now with, with this um, a picture of, of um, opium poppies. And, and they're very important, obviously, as a source of, of opioids for analgesia. They're included in the College of Anesthetists um, um, coat of arms, um, and which also emphasises the importance of, of analgesia and pain control. But what you may not realise is that this part of the slide here is actually a section of spinal cord. And these red blobs are actually neurons, and the green is um, staining for opioid receptors in the spinal cord. And this was uh, one of my students um, made this, this diagram. But it's really just to highlight that if we're thinking about using opioids or in fact any analgesia, we really need to have a strong bedrock of how those drugs are working and how best to use them. And that's particularly um, the case in children because the distribution and number of opioid receptors are changing, the structure and function of pain pathways are, are changing, and, and also the sort of outcomes and the pathophysiology of different conditions are all changing um, across that age range. The College of Anesthetists and the Faculty of Pain Medicine have been um, incredibly important in supporting education and, and research um, in the field of pain, both in the past, and I'm sure that will continue in the future um, and hopefully will improve even further the lives of children with pain. Thank you very much. <laughs>